Welcome to Hope and Heresy, Life on the Religious Left, where we wrestle with contemporary issues using history and theology as our guides. Our task is to reclaim religion for everyday people who want to live meaningfully without letting arbitrary doctrine or oppressive religious practice prevent us from asking big questions about our complicated world. I'm Rev. Sarah Lindsay. And I'm Rev. Peggy Clark, and we're Unitarian Universalist Ministers broadcasting from Community Church of New York here in New York City. Hello, Peggy. Sarah, it's good to see you. Good to see you too. Um, it's a little crazy right now with the holidays, right? It is. Hanukkah just ended. This is the end of our, our season too. We're end yeah, of season final two. Episode. <laughs> final episode of the season, right in the midst of, as all of you might imagine for ministers, a strange time of year, lots going on. Um, your parents. Yes, and parents, kids are home. They might scream in the distance. Don't worry, they're fine. Um, but yes, it is, um, we're coming up towards Christmas. We are, and and we're in the middle of Advent and solstice and, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then we, one of the things you and I were just talking about is that we all sort of assume that everyone knows the Christmas story. And first, I don't think we need to assume that. I don't know that everybody does know the story. And even people who do know the story don't always know the story. Right. And it took, took me a whole lot of education in reading and learning about our history to understand what some of that language even meant. Like, like what does it mean to, you know, be in the stable, <laughs> you know, to, yeah. or to be a virgin? Like, those are, those are words that we've, over thousands of years, we've, you know, reinvented and no longer mean what they, what they meant at all. Yeah. So I, I, I was thinking about this, um, growing up, right. I grew up Unitarian Universalist and in my house growing up, we celebrated Hanukkah and Passover with my Jewish grandpa. And we celebrated Easter and Christmas with my dad's Italian Catholic family. Right. So there was a lot of a mix of holidays. Um, other folks, much more deeply committed than we were, right? Um, but so if you'd asked me, right, if you'd asked my like 10 year old self what the story of Christmas was, right? I would have said to you, like based on one of our nativities and all of our Christmas books, I'd have been like, there was a couple, she was a virgin, an angel came down from heaven and impregnated her. And then they had to go somewhere to be counted for tax purposes, but there was no room at an inn. So they ended up with horses in a barn, a baby came out and then like Charlie Brown style, the angels sang. <laughs> in the heavens, right? Peace on earth. And that would have been the story that I told you, right? And in my mind, I would have totally been picturing one of the nativities we had around the house. It was like 100% like white people in like a medieval barn with, you know, sheep and shepherds all around. Maybe the wise men with like a camel or two, something like that, right? But that's what I probably, Mary may be blonde, right? That's probably what <laughs> I would have been picturing, right? I mean, right. If I'm honest, um, and that's not really the story. <laughs> no. Yeah. No. So I don't, do, do we want to tell the story? Do you want to try and walk? Let's, walk let's it? tell the story. And of course there are different stories, right? So there isn't a story. There are several stories. The gospel according to John doesn't tell any story. The gospel according to Luke and Matthew tell a similar story to each other, but with different pieces. I know when I'm doing this in, in church, I, I pick from gospels, mm -hmm. right? Mark is quick, Luke is, has more to say, Matthew really likes to elaborate. I mean, there are just pieces, and there are pieces that you'll find in one of those books and not in others, because each one of those communities, or it's not individual people, those were all communities telling stories, orally telling stories, and they told those stories for particular audiences and for a reason. And so Mark's gospel was the first and it is really short because there wasn't the time to elaborate and he had the same source as Luke and Matthew, but they had more time to elaborate. Matthew was Jewish, talking to a Jewish community and was using a lot of Jewish references and talked about Jesus in terms of his birth being part of the line of David, because that was really important that he was in that familial line. And Luke, they don't mention that at all. He's talking to a Greek audience 
he has a really different need in telling the story. And of course, birth stories for saviors have always been a big thing. Right? I mean, it wasn't Buddha. Buddha was born walking and talking. And so, because that's a way of saying that something magnificent has happened. So you create these stories. So the Christians also created this birth story to say something magnificent has happened. This is different. This birth wasn't like other births. Yeah. And yet some of those pieces are truly not scriptural, right? So Mary, the term really, I mean, you can help me here, but the term really is about being sort of a young unmarried person, right? This question of like Mary being um, a virgin and free from sin, right? This, I was saying to Peggy that my favorite like mistake that folks make is this idea that the immaculate conception refers to Jesus's conception when in fact, it refers to Mary's conception because for her to be worthy of bearing God in human form, she had to be without sin, right? Because she couldn't have been baptized because that wasn't a thing that was happening. And so the medieval people created this notion, right? It's a medieval creation that she was a virgin and had been born without sin, right? But the original text doesn't necessarily mean virgin in the way that we think of a virgin, right? Um, not only that, look, not uh -huh. only that, it also talks, we have we not only reinterpreted the word virgin to mean someone who hadn't had sex, we also interpreted that she never had sex for her whole life, even though in scripture, Jesus has brothers and sisters. So we created, and there's also a medieval invention, we created like previous marriage for Joseph and stepbrothers and that he was really very old, right? I mean, there's like a thousand ways that, that the story was recreated because of the ways that women were understood a thousand years later. But in the story, in the telling, none of those things were are in there, right? We have as a young woman who before being married was pregnant and then a story about this angel. And then, and later, I mean, he's, he, you know, when he dies, he's with his brother, I mean, so all that whole piece, right? That's all elaborated afterwards. Right, and you're right. So much of that comes into existence because you've got to align it with like a patrilineal society that cares about the ways that goods pass from fathers to sons, right? As opposed to anything else, like that takes a primacy in the medieval period. Um, but it's an interesting, <clears throat> the sort of thinking about how that the story gets worked over time to fit the culture and society that it serves, right, is a really interesting question to me. Um, and to think about uh, think about now um, and how we work it now. Right, well, and then what parts do we focus on? I mean, right, thinking, is it right this? No, it must have been last Christmas, maybe the Christmas before when um, we started, you know, we're putting babies in cages and talking a lot about immigration and and then the holding up of the story of Jesus and his family being exiled and becoming refugees, which is not a story that we usually tell. And because of the fact that historically there's sort of, that one's a hard one to reconcile with any of what was going on in history. So that came from somewhere else and is only in one of the gospels. So it's not a story we tell a lot, but in the last couple of years, and I'm not, I don't think I'm really hearing it so much this year, maybe because of the election, but the last couple of years, we've heard it a lot that Jesus was a refugee. I mean, we didn't hear that say 10 years ago when we weren't so concerned about refugees. Although I have to say the really cool thing about the Bible, the whole thing, and which is of course not a book, but many, many books, is that there's so much in there in every story. And one of the reasons that it has lived for so long is because whatever your historical moment, you can find some story in there that speaks to it. But but to your point, yes, this is what we keep doing. We, we reinvent the story to align with our current reality. That's, I love that point though about um, the idea and, and like the Christmas story is a perfect example of it too, as you said, the idea that you can take a story out of scripture and sort of apply it, right? Which, which lends itself to, yes, the sort of permanence, permanence isn't quite the right word, but the longevity, let's say, right? Versus like 
the Greek myths, right, which kind of pass have passed away. Not don't maybe there are some people living who are committed. To, I don't know, but but there are there are others, right? It's not just the the sort of Bible as Christians conceive it, right? The Hebrew scriptures for Jewish folks that have this perpetual sort of way of applying. Which is interesting when you when you think about like a really strict constructionist interpretation, right? So like if you think about the text as having to be literal, right, which some folks do, um, it kind of actually cuts off its ability to grow and mold to the world as it needs it. Do you know what I'm saying? Like it kind of prevents it from being, um, I don't want to say like malleable in some negative sense, but it prevents it from being applicable in perpetuity, right? Whereas if you can understand it as a nimble text whose purpose exactly is to be interpreted and reinterpreted over time in order to help everyone live better, see what I'm saying? Yeah, well, and most of the time that's exactly what happens, right? I mean, right. We, Will here, we, yeah. right. we've been doing that for 2000 years with this text. We keep reinterpreting and reimagining and reusing different pieces of it which is why I get really annoyed when people are so literal about it because they're usually just literal about one particular thing. About the thing they want to do. Right, it's like, this is the point I want to make is X. And look, if I look in the scripture, I find X. And you feel like, well, you know, you can also find Y and Z and R, <laughs> all kinds of things in there. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's tricky. But so it does, it raises for me this question of like right now, right? In the last, I feel like in our lifetime, um, and I couldn't tell you when it started, maybe you'll remember, but like the notion of a war on Christmas and like what the, um, you mentioned the phrase that folks use sometimes of like put the Christ back in Christmas, right? And so what does it mean to make demands about this particular story or this particular holiday um, rather than letting it be adaptable or inter interpretable? for folks in um, other ways, right? What does it mean to sort of say like, this thing has to be about this um, in this way? Yeah, I mean, you and I were talking about this before and there's this real debate, at least it's a debate that lives on in me around how much Christmas can be or should be appropriated or um, reimagined for different cultures and times and people, right? Is it, is it a strictly Christian holiday that belongs to people who call themselves Christian? And that goes to what we were talking about before and putting the Christ back in Christmas. And is it legitimate for them to say that, to say, this is my holiday and you've, you've taken it? Oh, and that's where we get the war on Christmas, right? Because look at what they've, you know, they've reinterpreted or can we say this is a holiday and this is a story that has so many truths and speaks to so many people in this time and in time for a you know for hundreds thousands of years that we it belongs to all of us and we all live into it in its mystery and in the richness of the many layers that it offers but see what this raises is the question of like Christian ubiquity, or as our producer Amy gave us the term, not that we didn't know it, but hegemony, right? That there's like, there's such a way in which especially American culture is Christian, right? That, that what does it mean to live in America in 2020 um, in terms of the like, Okay, here's what I want to ask. And I'm asking both of us because I, what is the actual, look, I'm going to pull a Charlie Brown. Like, what is the meaning of Christmas? Like on some level, not that I don't have an answer, but I think that's actually the question that Bear's asking because that determines its, um, that determines its like whether or not other people can have it, right? Like if the point of Christmas is, the savior who was God and part of the tr like Trinity was born and we're celebrating that, right? Like if that is what Christmas is for, the celebration of Christ as a baby, 
then that's one thing. And then maybe, yeah, maybe people shouldn't have it. And maybe it should really only belong to Christians. If it's like a deeply theologically committed, I think I want to argue that over time, and maybe this is just like my UU heart, but like that over time, it isn't really about Christ's birth so much as it is about Jesus's birth, right? The distinction being Jesus, the baby who became a man who preached things and about whom other folks wrote stories, including the idea that he was God, versus the birth of the Savior, known to be such at his birth as a baby, Christ always God, you know what I'm saying? Like that, and and the, the reality is, ask any five Christians and they'll tell you a different thing, right? And ask any five non-Christians, and they'll tell you a different thing, um, which may then bring us back to the question of the hegemony, that like you can't, once you gift gift to the entire world your dominant culture you just can't control it yeah I mean it, it, I'm sort of have this sense of like this you know low ascending and high descending Christology right this idea of like Jesus is born and and grows up to into the understanding that he is God versus so it's low ascending versus the high descending, like God becomes human right. in right. the person of Jesus. Um, so the interpretation that you're offering is this really Unitarian right. and potentially even um, not quite secular, but mainstream American, you know, and then every person has the potential to, if not be God, certainly participate in the divine mystery and that we are all part of it. In fact, God is made up of all of our parts. And that's, and in that way, it's, it's a celebration really for everybody because this is a story, it's a story of a birth that represents all of our births. And all of us are here to celebrate that every human is part of the divine light being birthed into the world and in that way it's it belongs to everybody well so this is making me ask myself like am i am i participating in like some subversive christianizing of the world by like taking it down to this level when in fact inherent in the holiday is a much higher sort of theological principle that's one way of but I think ultimately what I actually think is it's sort of taking the teeth out of um, this thing that has been used as a tool of assimilation and rendering it no longer the tool of the, of the dominant majority missionizing oppressor. Uh, I'm sorry I said it, but um, do you know what I'm saying? Like that by taking you know, Christianity spread once, once the Council of Nicaea kind of solidified things and they became, it became the religion, right, of the empire, it then spreads and it sort of absorbs and absorbs all before it as it goes, right? And, and we, we talked about this a little bit, like traditions live on and Christianity finds a way because it isn't place dependent, it finds a way to live in other cultures and other times in other places, allowing a kind of melding. You can think about, you know, missionizing to the north um, in Europe, right, and what happens with pagan cultures there. You can think about missionizing to Africa, to South America, to all these places where traditions and beliefs get kind of folded in, in a way they find an easy or uneasy piece together, right, and Christianity becomes the dominant thing. So is, in fact, the sort of the stripping out of the high theology, a stripping out of the, you know, the tools of dominance. I don't know. I'm just offering it as a notion. I have never thought about this before. I'm like very excited about it. I'm, throwing, <laughs> I'm so excited. I'm throwing pencils. No, for real. I feel like this could be what I preach on Christmas Eve. <laughs> I get excited about this stuff, Peggy. I think it's a really interesting question right by making by universalizing christian this this particular christian holiday am i participating in christian hegemony or am i twisting it as a way of making it liberatory as opposed to oppressive 
I don't have, I don't know. Are you? I don't know. <laughs> But I'm to meditate on it. Um, I mean, it's a really interesting question. Are, and one of the problems with it is that Christianity has been so redefined in so many ways that when we say Christianity, what do we even mean? Yeah, it's not. I mean, right, the, we were talking to Mac Brandon, Reverend Mac Brandon last week, and his form of Christianity is really different from say Pope Francis, right? I mean, they, on a Sunday morning, although for both it may be on a Sunday morning, it, what they're celebrating looks so different, the language that they're using and the way that, so what are we even, what are we even talking about? Which is in part how Christmas has become almost universal, at least in our culture, because it, Christianity can be redefined in so many different ways by so many people that we can take the holidays and make them look however we want. This puts me in mind actually of like our very first, maybe it wasn't the literal first episode, but early on when we talked about technology as tools and like whether or not it's a positive or a negative thing, right? And you could kind of say the same thing about religion, ritual, and belief, that they're tools. They're tools for living well and they can be used for good or for evil, right? So when you look at things like um, liberation theology, right, that's taking Christianity and using it for good, right? It's it's taking the story and turning it into a story of liberation, of emancipation, and it's applying it back against the oppressors for freedom's sake, right? Um, you can also take Christianity and think about empire building and missionizing and horrible, horrible things done in the name of Jesus, right? So it it's... It's making me think about how humans just have this very deep capacity to take the things that we develop, think about technology, military technology, even religion, and apply them according to our need, desire, sort of whatever the most negative term for desires is, right? Um, and then what that says about belief and action, right? So, sorry, my, my thread, it makes sense in my head. Um, <laughs> but this question of like, so many of us, myself included, right? So many of us um, celebrate Christmas or other holidays. We had our menorah out all Hanukkah, right? Like different holidays without the like deepest, highest theological backing for it, right? Like I do not believe I, I, we celebrate Easter. I do not believe that Jesus was the Messiah come to save everybody because we've sinned and we need to be saved and redeemed to God. That's what Easter is. I don't believe he rose from the dead at the third day and blah, blah. Like, I don't believe any of that, but I celebrate the holiday and the story has meaning for me in other ways. And so this question of like, when the ritual attached to a belief is liberated from the belief and becomes just a ritual, that people do for other reasons. I said earlier that I think that, you know, ritual outlasts belief. And I stand by that. I think that's part of what we're, that's the like cultural moment we're in is that beliefs are changing our approach, not everyone's, but our approach, many of our approach to scripture and myth and all of these things is, has shifted, is shifting, is always shifting maybe. Um, and yet our human desire to have rituals that mark time and bring us together and celebrate the passage of the seasons, right? Still remains that that's like a deeply ingrained need. I agree. It is a deeply ingrained need, and we we require ritual and we require storytelling. And religion is the most persistent way that we get those needs met. And I I've seen secularists trying to recreate it, right? the new Genesis story. And there are so many projects like this, but none of them compare, I think because the mythology of religion is so deeply ingrained. It's so saturated our culture that whatever else we create automatically lays on top of it rather than 
there. It can't, it can't sink in in the same way because that's already part of who we are. Yeah, we're not all celebrating Festivus. Right, right. And, and yet, well, and to say, which doesn't mean you can't actually create ritual and tradition, right? I mean, Kwanzaa was created and mm -hmm. is absolutely part of culture. So it can be created. But even Kwanzaa was aware that it was being laid on top of a culture that already existed. I mean, it is in, it starts December 26th for a reason and it's been created, right? So, and yet the question for me still remains, can we, is it really okay that we just say, well, I don't believe, I mean, I actually am Christian, so this isn't personal to me, but to say, I don't believe in Jesus at all. I don't believe in, in any of the Christian tenets at all, but I am celebrating Christmas and I'm gonna change the words to all of the Christmas carols so that they align with my own theology or my own not theology or my own belief system. Is it okay that I don't do any of the traditional religious things or even realign them so that they work for me or is that appropriation and i know i know that there's a way in which christianity has become so part of the culture that how do you appropriate something that is absolutely saturated yeah i mean i think that would be my argument i think to that last point would be that you really can't you cannot appropriate a thing that you are essentially forced to be part of no matter what right in other words it's not like out of nowhere, I'm choosing to have a Christmas tree, right? Like even, even for those folks who are completely, have nothing to do with Christianity at all in their family or their traditions, they are confronted by Christmas <laughs> pretty much nonstop starting at Halloween now, right? Like it creeps up earlier and earlier every year. So I think that there's some way in which you could sort of, the argument can, I think, easily be made that there's no such thing as appropriation of the totally ubiquitous dominant culture like it kind of this was my point before it's gotten to the place where it kind of by its own work belongs to everyone right um to some degree uh but but i think you the point is the beliefs don't belong to everyone right the so so i had friends growing up it was a, a family one of my dearest friends they moved away when i was young i was so sad about it but um they were jewish mom and dad jewish children being raised jewish like really like no hint of christianity anywhere in this family tree but they had a christmas tree every year and i think that i think that the way that i come to under came to understand that was not that they were trying to like take christmas or say something different about what Christmas means, right? Or like redefine it even. It was just like the culture we live in does this thing and Christmas trees are pretty and like, why wouldn't we be allowed to have one, right? Like, and I realized that doesn't fly for everyone. Um, but I sort of saw it less as some kind of like intentional or, or even unintentional appropriation of some culture that wasn't theirs, more as a embracing of the part of this season that's forced upon all of us that was embraceable, right? It, it was not, I'm going to twist the theology and make it something else. It was, I'm going to take this part that's kind of like, honestly, come to be pretty secular and frankly, not that traditional, right? Christmas well, trees are only like, what do we say? Like 400 years old, 500 years old. Um, yeah, go ahead. So, so that's, so I, I think that really what's happened is that around this birth story were, grew all of these different traditions, right? Things like a Christmas tree, which we might 16th century Germany or, or Santa Claus, which is I think 19th century. Um, all, these are not actually Christmas or these aren't birth stories. Well, what they were created by Christians for this celebration of this birth, but not directly related to the theology. So right. it really feels like um, non-Christian society 
has taken on all of those not really Christian pieces. I mean, when I was a kid, we, my mother was Jewish, my father was Catholic, and we always had a Christmas tree and celebrated Christmas, but my mother was Jewish and, and grew up without Christmas and didn't like that at all. And it was a very awkward experience for her to not be able to celebrate with everybody else. So when she was now allowed to celebrate Christmas, when I was little, she had a Christmas party for Jewish kids. All the Jewish kids, we lived in a building and all the Jewish kids from the building would come to our house for Christmas. And one of the Jewish dads would dress up like Santa because he loved doing that. And he would give out all the presents that my parents had bought for all the Jewish kids because their own parents wanted their kids to have that experience but couldn't bring themselves to doing it. There's a way that that society has just taken on those traditions and then, you know, inviting kids over for Santa Claus and presents has nothing to do with the birth of Jesus. So, I mean, in some way, what we've done is we've, we've created a whole other holiday and then linked it. And maybe what needs to happen is that we need to just disassociate them a little bit and let all those people who feel like you got to keep the Christ in Christmas, keep it. And because it is their holiday and it is a religious holiday and it is their theology and let the people who don't have that theological connection still celebrate and do all the things that are meaningful for them. I'm really aware of the time and we're gonna need to wrap this up at some point, but I'm wondering if you have a tradition when you were a kid that um, you remember. I mean, loads of them. <laughs> loads of them. I'll have to, if you have one ready to hand, you should share it while I think about what we well, should do. Well, I just did, right? That yeah. having this party with all the Jewish kids was definitely part of my growing up in a, in a multi-faith home, yeah. for sure. I mean, there's, I mean, there's, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm like on the spot. I'm like, I don't know. No, like, we were <laughs> no, no, it's okay. Um, but there's, I think they're not any different from most people, right? Like we would see part of the family on Christmas Eve and the other side of the family on Christmas Day. I have to tell you my one favorite thing I will say, we used to, my mother has three siblings. And so all of the siblings and the grandparents and the children on that side would all get together on Christmas Day. So 25, 30 people, and there would be um, a huge stocking exchange. So my aunt had these really long knit stockings for every single person. And you had to buy something that was like one or $2, no more. And then the undoing of the stockings, all these people at the same time involved loads of like tissue paper, sorry, environment flying all over, like throwing it at each other's heads. And then when everything was undone and there was always such crap in these stockings, the trading would begin and there would be a whole like marketplace system of like, <laughs> I'm gonna corner the market on the paper clips, right? Like there was just, and that I have very, as you can tell, like very fond memories of that time of like, because they weren't, no one was like, how dare you trade away my, you know, pad of paper. It was just the whole point was sort of this elaborate, event of unboxing and then like you know making trades for things you really didn't want to read anyway um which may be what christmas has become the commercialization of like yeah i had to do it you know but that's your point about dissociating the things that we do and the i think it's really one to think about because i don't even know i don't know how that would happen what that would look like or if in fact it would be a disservice right I think it's already happening. I think it's I think it's what we're seeing. I think I think we're seeing, you know, Jewish kids putting up Christmas trees because because it's part of who we are and what, how we celebrate and it doesn't have anything to do. Well, but so it brings you back to this question of high theology versus low, right? It doesn't have anything to do with Christ, but it does have something to do with the value of family and care and spending time together and showing compassion and love, right? Like, I mean, yeah, if literally all you're doing is throwing up a tree and like giving each other gifts and you're not spending extra time or taking time together to decorate that tree or donating, volunteering, whatever, then okay, maybe, yeah, then it's totally divorced from any notion of, right? If you're just leaning hard into the commercialism, then that's one thing. But I think for a lot of folks, there is actually, maybe it's not theology, but there is actually belief and energy and something 
real and deeper than just formulaic ritual around the celebration of Christmas, even for folks who are not committed Christians. And I sort of claim this for myself, like there is something real about it. There is a real, you know, and for me, there's a legitimate theology around it. It just isn't a Christ-based theology, right? It's a Jesus-based theology. Um, it's complicated stuff. It is. It is. And lucky for us, we have a whole nother season after this to try and yeah. tease it all out. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. It's been great talking to you, Sarah. You too. Have a really nice holiday. You too. Thanks. <laughs> 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 Safe service. <laughs> That's right.